All right, so let me get started with it. Um, you all probably have heard of serverless computing. It's very popular these days. Um, appealing things about it is that it's paper use and um, providers take care of a lot of provisioning aspects. So developers, you know, just focusing on building the application and the nature of being event driven allows you to do lots of cool things with serverless. Which is why, you know, you probably have heard a lot about how this market is going to grow in the next few years. Um, currently, this data is from a year ago, more than half of the organizations using cloud actually have um, serverless applications one way or another. And if you're uh, in, in doing research, you probably saw that uh, the serverless papers are exploding, right? So you see it up and down everywhere. Um, aside from popularity of serverless, uh, um, there's also complexity of serverless applications, which is growing. Um, when I did the characterization of Azure workload in 2019 and 2020, majority of applications had only one function. And this is starting to change now. Um, so Azure is reporting that they have had significant growth in uh, DAGs or workflows that our people are building using serverless applications. Uh, same goes with, you know, um, if you just analyze open source serverless applications that are available, it seems that a significant portion is now uh, comprised of workflows. So why do I say all of this? Is because it seems like serverless is actually gaining traction. Right? People are starting to use it beyond just the free tiers. And the types of applications that you're building with serverless is also diversifying. So let me dive into our proposal. Let's say you are a development team and you have one or more serverless applications. Um, you probably are using some serverless service to deploy that. It could be AWS Lambda, it could be Azure Functions, Google Cloud Functions, or anything. So that is part of that cloud. You might happen to have a bunch of VMs also, right? So often you just don't go use serverless. You also have virtual machines, uh, you might have VMs on a different cloud or you might have on your own servers. Right? So the question we are trying to ask in this project is whether we can leverage unused capacity of those alternative hosts, in this case VMs on cloud A, cloud B, or your own servers to run your own functions. And just to be very clear, we are not here proposing offloading your functions to some other random uh, user's VMs or offloading some random user's functions to your VMs. This is because of security implications. You know, if you're in the loop, it, may, it might make sense to actually run your own functions on your own infrastructure. So you might ask, why would we want to do that? Turns out virtual machines are quite often underutilized, right? Providers know how to harvest those resources and sell it to others, or actually run internal batch workloads on those. But at the end of the day, you have to pay full price for your VMs, right? Nothing goes back to your pocket. Indirectly, the price has become slightly cheaper, but directly, nothing goes back to your pocket. So might as well take advantage of that and use capacity. If you can do that transparently, that'd be pretty awesome. And if you have you know, on-premise um, servers or infrastructure already in-house, why not use that? You already paid for the capital, and um, they're going to, uh, anyways, uh, incur operating costs. If you can actually migrate functions opportunistically to this infrastructure, not only we can reduce the serverless bills, but also we can improve the efficiency of these other resources. Overall, that's good for the planet. You know, we can reduce the carbon footprint of our compute. So you may now ask, well, at a high level, does, does this idea make sense? And um, I think it makes sense because often, um, not always, but often, serverless functions are stateless. And if that's the case, you can execute them anywhere as long as they interact with the state of your application being in a database or back in the storage properly. They're event driven, so if an event comes, you can just direct it to the right place. Um, they happen to be short. So if you have these uh, bubbles of available resources on your infrastructure, even for tens of seconds or a few seconds, you may as well uh, leverage that to run a bunch of functions so to the left, you see the distribution of execution times for serverless functions in our analysis in 2019, 2020. And back then, the medium execution time was slightly less than one second. Um, to the right, you see the more recent data uh, from uh, those who use Datadog for parsing their, um, I believe in this case, AWS Lambda um, applications. And you see that 
more and more these executions are becoming shorter. Now the median is 60 milliseconds, right? So if that's the case, again, yes, there exist tails of functions, but for the median case, if your functions are short, even a few seconds of resource availability on your host can be leveraged to run your functions. Um, as I said, by design, these applications have some degree of disaggregation, right? Compute is that disaggregated from your storage or databases. And that's fantastic because that way they can migrate the computational functions everywhere. As long as they can communicate to the rest of the system, that should be fine. Another cool thing that I alluded to is that, well, if now we are building, starting to build more complex applications, let's say in form of DAGs or workflows, okay? Not everything is on the critical path. So might, uh, you might experience a critical path of performance in one of your branches. It means that typically you have functions that have some positive slack for you to move around without affecting the end-to-end -end latency of your entire workflow. And finally, people have various demands. Believe it or not, not everyone cares about latency, right? You might be using serverless functions for nightly jobs, right? You don't care about latency and you care about minimizing your cost. If you care about latency, maybe you care about it in the orders of milliseconds, which I would argue perhaps you don't want to use serverless for. But if, you know, if your uh, requirement or QoS requirement is more loose, maybe you can communicate that it's still loose amount of floating. All right, so hopefully by now you are a little bit convinced about the high level that, okay, this idea might not be that crazy or might make sense. And if you wanna actually achieve that goal, you need to ask a bunch of questions from yourself. Like, first of all, how would I offload actually? What would be the mechanism that offloads one function to some other place? And I would change that a second from now and do it with very low impact on scheduling. Where should I upload these two at even in a, any given moment? Given that you know, the proposal I showed you, we are floating to uh, alternative hosts that are sitting outside that cloud, right? So there is latency implications, right? Should I be floating to this VM, you know, from this function on East Coast to East Coast or to West Coast to wherever? And determining the optimal of floating, right? Um, not all functions in your workflow are the same and finding what part, function, which portion of that should be offloaded to which host becomes another question. So at a high level, this is our system overview. Um, we strive for building a system that comes, in, comes with no uh, change to existing serverless platforms, right? I gotta say, this is suboptimal. If we wanted to change the serverless platform itself, things would have been better in terms of cost savings and offering lower latency but we really wanted to have something that works plug and play with existing serverless systems, okay? So what the way we do it is that you modify the workflow or application slightly in that we add a few functions here and there and we add some, inject some code at the end of some of our functions and asynchronously communicate with this scheduler that sits on one of the offloading hosts. If these hosts are supposed to be running your functions, so perhaps there is some resources available for you to periodically run your scheduler, okay? Um, so we would leverage that, and that way the scheduler is not constantly incurring costs. Um, we're not dedicating a VM or container for that. And that the scheduler basically gets triggered by certain events and calculates the best offloading scenarios and puts it in a data store, which will later be read by that header function that we add to the function. So in a way, it allows us to not add any a constant scheduler at the beginning of or in front of every single incoming request, but it still allows us to communicate optimal decisions. Um, the way we glue everything is through pops up. So it's a messaging system that allows you to communicate or send messages from a publisher to a subscriber to uh, different topics or channels. So, we again, we went for it because there exists good support for pops up messaging systems on different cloud providers. AWS has SNS, Google has pops up, different providers. And also, different programming languages have very strong support for uh, libraries that allow you to use pops up. So, at a high level, you know, you can think that if each function is being told where to invoke its next function, it's just a matter of calling the right pops up topic. Okay, so if I call pops up topic two, F2 would be invoked. And if I call pops up um, um, host topic one, 
that message would be sent to my first host. Okay. So here, the function itself is not doing any sort of a scheduling. It's not taking any scheduling decision. It's just calling the right pops up that just connects to the right destination. And the way does, we do it is that we add this small code snippet to the bottom of every single non-terminal function. So basically, you can see that it looks at the routing information that has been sent to it. And if it's zero, it means there's no offloading. So it just goes to the hard-coded pops up topic corresponding to the next function down the DAC. However, if there was something non-zero, it would point to one of the specific channels that uh, connects you to one of the hosts. Okay. So for all of this to work, you need to add this header function that reads these routing decisions from the data store and just piggybacks it to the messages to be consumed downstream by the functions in your workflow. So we, we modified the DAG slightly to be able to send these messages downstream and also for merging. And in other words, we have to do some of the orchestration tasks that might be already happening with um, systems like AWS Step Functions. We are doing it in our framework in this case. So as I mentioned earlier, for the scheduler, our goal is to do opportunistic harvesting. We are not here designing a system that spawns new hosts or new VMs to run your functions on. It assumes that already you have some resources. It could be 10 VMs, two servers, one laptop that you want to offload to. Okay? So we want to opportunistically offload to these. And our constraint, big constraint, was that we don't want to add anything to the critical path of the scheduling. And we don't want to have support from the provider's scheduler because it's hard to convince uh, for instance, a cloud provider to change their scheduler so that you can redirect the messages uh, to my hosts. So in that, um, as I said, a scheduler sits in one of the hosts, what we call the leader host, um, and um, basically runs our solver. And that's basically the brain of the system. So how do we solve this problem, meaning determining the optimal of loading? We look at a lot of information. Okay? So part of these are the logs that we gather during the execution, right? So as the application primarily runs on serverless, we gather logs and we know how much was the distribution of execution times for functions and um, what is, and then we start offloading slowly. We know the latencies between our uh, serverless deployment and each of the hosts. We also have some predictions of the resources that are gonna be available on each host. So as you know, this is a distributed system now. From the time uh, an invocation comes to serverless to the time the function is brought to a host, it takes time. And you want to make sure that until that time, the resources are still going to be available. So that's why we need to do some amount of uh, prediction or forecasting of resources at each host for the next second or two seconds at that scale. And also, we take into consideration what is it that the developer is striving for. They might say, OK, I really care about minimizing cost. So they would run the system in the cost mode. Or they might say, well, latency matters to me, and my latency tolerance is two seconds. So try to make sure that the added latency to my workflow is within two seconds. And this is something also that the system takes into account. All of this goes into a mixed integer nonlinear programming solver. Okay, So you can, you can see that this is an optimization problem. Given all of this, I can determine what percentage of the traffic for each function should be offloaded to where. Okay. But this is something moving forward we want to optimize and make it better because it doesn't quite scale. It's if, you're up, if you are doing this for many, many workflows and for many hosts, it takes time. And this is something we are working on to uh, improve. But something that was important because there's a lot of performance jitter in serverless and communication, you can't just use average statistics or just median statistics. So we had to look at confidence intervals the worst case scenarios of things happening on the host or best case scenarios of things happening on the server side, and that allowed us to have some degree of you know, tolerance to performance jitters in our, in our logs. All of this is used to eventually decide these you know, routing numbers. Effectively, you, just send, you need to send the routing and some probability. So you're gonna offload to this host 20% of the time, and each function just uh, flips coins, and based on what's the outcome of that coin flip, determines whether to offload or not. So at the core of this solver, 
any optimization problem has an objective and a bunch of constraints, right? Our objective here is to minimize the cost of that application running on serverless. It means that the solver would prioritize offloading functions that run for longer, consume more resources, and also um, um, have higher invocation rate. Okay, so that's the optimization goal because the underlying cost model is that the VMs or servers already cost you money. Okay, so this is the cost we're trying to mitigate. Of course, there's also cost associated with moving the data around or using these pop up services. That is also accounted for. What is the constraint? Well, all of these offloading should fit inside the available resources on these hosts. So that's the constraint. If you're just caring about cost, if you care about latency as well, well, the added latency of the communication and execution delays should also be taken into account. I mentioned earlier that each host monitors the resources that is available for offloading and predicts in future. So in this model, you don't want to overshoot or undershoot. If you undershoot the resources that are going to be available, there is not enough room for offloading. If you overshoot, you're going to step on host processes food. Right? So that's why we define this prediction score, which hits the balance between how much of the available resources we can reclaim and how many times we violate. And we use some Azure data with 1 million VMs. Turns out you know, a simple markup chain would do the job for us pretty OK. You know, this could be something that we could squeeze further a bit in future, but for now we are happy with it. You might ask, well, after you offload a function, what, what would happen? So if it's the first time you can use the Google Cloud CLI or AWS CLIs to just pull the image or pull a function source code or corresponding programming language versions and such and build the image yourself and just run it. To set the correct resources, we just look at the, whatever amount of memory was allocated to that function on the cloud. For allocating the CPU, we do it using a feedback mechanism. So initially, we give each function one core. As we learn how much CPU it requires, we adjust the CPU allocation. For the details, please look at the paper. The other thing I did mention earlier is that using PopSub allows us to provide certain degree of fault tolerance um, because already cloud providers have done a great job uh, to provide features such as dead letter topics, meaning that if, it, uh, if a topic was not responding, you can send it back to some other topic. Um, they have exactly once delivery guarantees sometimes, and they have reply policies that plays in, in our favor. So quickly going for showing you some evaluation results. These are the benchmarks that we used. We tried to go for benchmarks that are actually useful applications that one would use app, uh, serverless for. We try to look at different structures of workflows, like single function, chains of function, maybe um, two branches. Branches are balanced or imbalanced, or when you have dynamic fanout. So depending on the input parameter, you would have different degrees of fanout. Um, see here, you can see some highlights of, highlights of our results. Um, the red curves uh, correspond to latency mode and green for cost mode. And this is a very small host. This is just a VM with four vCPUs, 16 gigs of RAM, and you see that we can still offer some cost savings. Of course, as the traffic rate for your application goes higher, you would have less cost savings just because there's not enough room um, to, fit it, to fit everything inside your hosts. And also, you can see that the latency overall is better controlled in the latency mode. So for instance, if you look at the image processing application, you see that for average latency, you're controlling it better in the latency mode, but it means that you are offering less cost savings. Naturally, if you use a larger host, you can offer more benefits. So in this case, we use different VMs belonging to the same family. As we move towards using larger and larger VMs, you see that these curves move toward the right, meaning that with the same traffic rate, you can offer more cost savings. And this is ideally what we want to see. Another important aspect is that as Host processes start to run, you need to quickly back off and don't intervene with the performance of those processes. And this is what you see in this example. So during that period, Apache Spark task is running on the host. And you see that before that, many of the invocations cost a very small amount. And those are the ones that are being offloaded. During pe this period, offloading stops. And you see that all our invocations cost a lot. This is because you know, we're not offering any cost savings. 
and immediately after those tasks uh, end, you know, after some delay, actually not immediately, but as you can start to see some offloading happening. So all in all, uh, we compared ourselves to different ways of building serverless workflows. And um, you can see that um, um, we see two big trends. One is that using um, existing orchestration systems such as Google Workflows or AWS Step Functions has costs associated with it, right? So um, you know, the number of states that you use has cost implication. Um, but another thing that we see, depending on the nature of your application, you can offer a lot of cost savings with this system. For instance, uh, for the video analytics application, we can offer up to 90% cost saving with almost 10% implication on latency. Right? But not all applications would be fine with this approach. Of course, if you have a chain of functions, any offloading would come into the critical path, and this is not ideal. Um, in conclusion, we built this platform to be able to um, showcase that you can migrate functions given existing services without any change to the service platforms. We used it primarily for cost purposes, but I can think that this system can be expanded for other purposes, such as bringing your compute closer to data when you have sovereignty or data residency regulation and for other purposes. Uh, the system is open source, so if you're interested, please take a look and come talk to me. But thank you for your attention.